generic yet polite salutations, folks. This is Trent Mayfair coming to you from Beaver Dick Park in Idaho because at heart I am 12 years old and I had to. So, I went to Legends of Garar this past weekend. And before I get into what I saw and learned from the event, I would like to talk a little bit about what I saw between uh, Regzerit and Legends of Garar. And the first thing that I have to talk about is I went to Evermore Park. And this can best be described as a LARP on steroids song because, oh my god, they must have sunk around like several millions of dollars into this park. The architecture is not to be believed. The acting and makeup are beyond stunning. Um, and if I had millions of dollars to spend on LARP, it is totally what I would do. Um, if you're ever in the Salt Lake City area, do yourself a favor, take the time, take the trip down south uh, of the city in order to actually see it. If you're within like six to eight hours worth of driving time, it's well worth it to take a trip. So, uh, in addition to this, I made a little side quest over to Southern Utah so that I could um, indulge in a bit of personal nostalgia, not just for myself, but for some other people as well. And uh, here's a little video about that one. I would like to dedicate this next song on location to my mother who first introduced me to the song as well as to my best friend who reintroduced me to the song and taught me the proper lyrics for it. One evening as the sun went down and the jungle fire was burning Up the track come a hobo packing And he says, boys, I'm not turning I'm headed for a land that's clear and bright beside the crystal fountain So come with me and we'll go see the big rock hand mountains In the big rock hand mountains There's a land that's fair and bright where the handouts grow on bushes and you can sleep out every night Where the boxcars all are empty and the sun shines every day On the birds and the bees and the cigarette trees and the rock ground springs Where the wangdoodle sings in the big rock candy mountains In the big rock candy mountains The cops have wooden legs The bulldogs all have rubber teeth and the hens lay soft boiled eggs the farmer's trees are full of fruit and the barns are full of hay. Oh, I'm bound to go where there ain't no snow, where the wind don't blow and the rain don't fall in the big rock hand mountains. In the big rock hand mountains, you never change your socks and little streams of alcohol come a trickling down the rocks. The, the brakemen have to tip their hats and the railroad bulls are blind. There's a lake of stew and a whiskey too. You can paddle all around them in a big canoe in the Big Rock Candy Mountains. In the Big Rock Candy Mountains, the jails are made of tin. And you can walk right out again as soon as you are in. There ain't no short-handled shovels, no axes, saws, or picks. I'm bound to stay where you sleep all day, where they hung the jerk who invented work in the Big Rock Candy Mountains. I'll see you all this coming fall in the Big Rock Candy Mountains. Top that creepy on location. So after that little side quest, I uh, headed up towards Yellowstone because I thought, hey, how cool would it be to camp in Yellowstone and shoot the Regzerid video from there? And I was fully ready to camp. Apparently so were a lot of other people because basically every single campsite was full. And as I was getting to the other edge of Yellowstone, for those of you who know the park, you know just how long of a drive that actually is, um, it began to storm. And when I say storm, I'm talking lightning, thunder, pouring rain, mixed in with snow, sleet, and hail. Um, I, I, have, I have a policy, when the weather turns biblical, I don't camp. I, I, I know it is rather pusillanimous of me, but quite honestly, I am not afraid to admit that I am a coward and I do like my little comforts. So, I tried to find a hotel or motel room in the area. The cheapest that I could find was $500 a night. Um, so, I drove back into Idaho and managed to find a small motel room there for that night. 
The following night, however, well, the local college, Brigham Young University, Idaho, is having their move-in weekend. So, I actually was unable to find a motel room for within a hundred miles of where I was. <clears throat> and the problem was, well, I, I ended up at a campsite, but it still dropped down to about 35 degrees that night, and it was really, really, really cold. So, basically, I woke up, threw on my cloak, recorded the Rexerit video, and I do apologize for the poor video quality on that one. But, uh, I did manage to read the rule book for Legends of Garar about an hour before the GM showed up to start setting up for the game. So, you know, it was a fun week and an interesting week, to say the least. Now, in regards to Legends of Garar, um, the administration itself, uh, they are coordinated, but the GM does seem to have a little bit of an issue of letting go of control so that his assistants can actually step up and help him run the game as opposed to just being the means to enacting his stories. Um, however, they are all on the same page. The GM doesn't show that everybody knows what they need to know. They are coordinated. It's just a little bit of trouble letting go. And it was explained to me that he was very new to having assistance for this. He's used to doing this on his own. He's had bad experiences in the past. So I can absolutely understand why it is that he might have a bit of trouble letting go. But as soon as he does learn to do that, I think that his game is going to be that much better because then he won't have to focus on everything and he won't feel so overwhelmed. Um... In regards to helpfulness, yes, the administration was wonderfully helpful in just about every area, and they were so on point in regards to hydration. Every time that there was a break, who needs water? Wonderful thing to see. You always want to keep your players hydrated. Last thing you want is somebody passing out due to dehydration at your game. Um, insofar as helpfulness... Um, they were a bit more focused on getting their storyline out than rolling with players' punches from what I saw. However, I think that I have a skewed view of this because it was explained to me uh, by other players and later uh, confirmed and discussed at length with the GM uh, that there was a number of players who were basically coming in and trying to take control of the game and ruin the storylines for everybody and basically just troll because they wanted this uh, LARP for themselves and they didn't get it because that's not where everyone else wanted to go. And, well, in a LARP, you have to do with you have to go with what the GM and the majority of the players want. You can't just have the small pocket group taking control of everything and claiming things for themselves and then going, well, this is ours now. Uh, so, yeah, basically because there was a bunch of people trying to usurp everything, I, uh, from my point of view, you know, the new, the new player, the one who is coming in and just kind of like looking around, seeing what they can learn, from my point of view, it looked like the GM was railroading the story. However, I... I don't, in hindsight, I don't believe that's true knowing what I know now because he was basically trying to prevent this small group of players from hijacking the story and ruining it for everyone. So, moving on to the rule book. Um, my initial read through of the rule book was that it's short, it's simple, it seems very combat focused, but it also seemed a little sparse. Uh, there is such a thing as too short and too simple. Um, and again, it's, uh, it, it, it's predominantly influenced by a European Norse LARP uh, as opposed to American LARPs. American LARPs tend to focus more on numbers. European LARPs tend to focus uh, more on uh, simplicity of rules and people actually being able to do things for themselves as opposed to having a mechanic for it. Uh, so it's, it, it's understandable, like, where he's coming from with it, but I'm not, you know, certain that that is the direction that I personally would want to go, because that's not the type of LARP that I would want to run. I like numbers. I like math. That's just what it is. Um, you know, this group, they seem to like actually being able to do the real thing, and for the most part, most of them can. Um, 
And truth be told, the strength of this rulebook does lie in its simplicity because basically you can read through it once, maybe twice, and you can basically walk into game knowing everything that you need to, uh, including your skills and spells and what have you. Uh, but that does also bring me to uh, the aspect of diversity of characters, uh, which is the fact that um, every class in this game only gets one skill. And that gets a little bit boring because now it's not just, hey, I only have this one thing that I do. I'm just going to keep doing that. It's also an aspect of, while well, I'm doing that, this other person who's the same class as me is also doing that. So it becomes very cookie cutter with the exception of the individual role play of the actual player. So, you know, and I'm all for LARPs based in realism. Uh... But when every character class feels the same, the class system becomes boring in my opinion, and the game feels somewhat stagnant. There's no real growth for the characters. I know this. Now what? We'll go and use it. Okay. Well, can I use it this way? No, no, that's against the rules. Okay, so I can only use it this way. It, 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 it stagnates a character's um, power growth, as it were, because the point of these sorts of games, it's not just to follow the storyline, it's also to feel your character growing as an individual. And that's not just from a roleplay side, that's also a skill side. As you grow, you learn more skills. Um, I don't believe I saw mechanics for cross-classing in this game, but you can switch classes, so at least you are not stuck in what you are. Um, you know, but again, it's... The idea of everything in balance is different from everyone being equal. And when everyone is equal, what's the cost of that? That is something that we always have to keep in mind when we are designing games. All that being said, the GM did also inform me that he was going to be putting the game through another rules change in a couple of weeks. So this might all be a moot point at that, but I still did learn things from it. Now, in regards to the immersion level, the immersion was a bit light, admittedly, but there was also a long break overnight, so people weren't expected to be in character in the early morning hours. Uh, people didn't seem to mind slipping in and out of character, but I also got the impression that most players really did have that decent handle uh, on, you know, in character versus out of character and managing the bleed over and, again, most of them. Um, Many of these are young and new LARPers, and so don't always know what they're doing, but again, they do seem to pick up fairly quickly. Um, and by and large, I did find most people to be immersed when they were actually out in the field and on the quests and doing all of the uh, like major combats and collecting the items and doing the rituals and stuff like that. Like at, at those points, they were totally immersed in the world, and it was wonderful to see. Now, insofar as my overall experience, um, what I learned from observing the game is that paths are great for getting to places, fields, woods, and brush are for hunting and fighting, unless you're afraid of ticks, which I very much am. Uh, I'm from the East Coast, we even just got a new type of tick there, you can look it up online, they are horrifying. Um, but the way that they utilize the land, not just for uh, general moving around and setting up scenes and stuff, but also seeing NPCs uh, utilize uh, like Sun Tzu art of war tactics and utilize the land to their advantage. Oh, we got a lake on this side. It's filled with algae and like stagnant swamp water. Nobody's going to want to swim through that. We got 20 feet of brush on this side. We are, we can only be approached from this side or this side. And yeah, we're good. It was really interesting to see that and see how the players tried to have to overcome that. Um, what I learned from the players is that Patience, understanding, and compassion are all required, no matter how much individuals might push you without knowing it. That being said, know your limits, know the lines that you will not let people cross, and stick to those lines. And when somebody crosses them, punish them. Do not be afraid to actually call somebody out and punish them if needed. 
And that's basically also what I learned from the GMs, is that it's possible to be too kind and compassionate. Uh, if actions are not taken to curtail certain undesirable behaviors, it will ruin your game for everybody. Again, those trolls. I feel that while they were very compassionate and understanding and kind and they showed a great deal of patience with these uh, trolls who came in to basically try and usurp the game, this was not an isolated incident and I witnessed twice within 30 minutes as one of these trolls bashed an NPC in the face and drew a cut on their nose and then like you know, we took him aside, we explained to him how to safely use a shield in this kind of a game and everything like that, and 30 minutes later, he literally shield bashes somebody right in the nose with the rim, and, like, oh, he almost broke their nose, it was gushing blood. Um, it was, like, at that point, I feel that any GM or marshal or what have you needs to have the authority to stop the game take that person aside and say, you are no longer allowed to do combat. You may not participate in that aspect of this game anymore, and if you continue this behavior, we will ban you from the game. The... And again, the individual is going to be punished. I spoke at length with the GM and the administration and everything about it uh, after the game, and... I gave them my perspective on it, I told them what I had witnessed, and, you know, they explained this is a pattern of behavior. And that's what I mean when I say being too kind and compassionate. If that's a pattern and that's happening all the time, just get rid of them. It's that simple. And, well, it's never that simple, but you, you, I, I hope that you all understand where I'm coming from when I say that you can't always pander to everyone at your game. The job of the GM is to say no to the players. The job of the GM staff is to say no to the GM. So, I hope that you all enjoyed that. I certainly did enjoy my experience at Legends of Garar. I had an absolute blast. It's wonderful people. I had a fun time. I do hope that you all join me in two weeks down in San Diego at Twin Mask. Unfortunately, I was planning on going to Dying Light this coming weekend. But I have heard some rather disturbing things about them, and I've been unable to find another LARP in that area of the country that runs on that particular weekend. So I will be skipping Dying Light, uh, and I will see you in two weeks at Twin Mask. Until then. All that being said, I would recommend reading up on the rulebook and all the factions and everything before you come to game, so that way you can tailor your character better and uh, actually know what faction you're going to want to join before you come into the game.